So we're going to be doing a walkthrough of Blondie and this Excel file is available in D2L so or Brightspace you can download it and you can work it on your own first which is a great idea and we're going to be doing the material and labor variances so that's a little bit of a review and also the variable and fixed overhead variances. So here we have the standards we have standards for material, which include a quantity and price, and for labor, a quantity and a price. For standard variable overhead, you can't go buy variable overhead at the store. So we can't have a standard quantity and a standard price the way we can materials and labor, which you do actually purchase individually. That variable overhead is a collection of items. So we get an average rate based on some cost driver. Here the cost driver is direct labor hours. So the average rate for that pool of costs is $3 per direct labor hour. And we have a similar situation for fixed overhead. You can't go buy fixed overhead. In fact, fixed overhead is a amount per month typically. And so it's not per labor hour, but we want to apply it to products. So we do smooth it across some labor hour some cost driver here, that cost driver is direct labor hours. Uh, but we always want to keep in mind that the $1.50 is a function of volume. They tell us that the box's budget is 90000 so And that, of course, if anything happens to volume, that one fifty dollars per direct labor hour will shift. That's not true for the other items because they're variable. So we also have actual. And so we have the number of finished goods produced. And then we have the chemicals purchased, so that's raw materials. And we have chemicals used, which is different than what was bought. And then we have the cost of those chemicals that were purchased up here. And I calculated here, just for fun, what the cost per unit was. So I already have a little idea that they paid a little bit too much for the chemicals. So I already know in my mind that I'm gonna have an unfavorable price variance on materials. Direct labor hours incurred, direct labor payroll costs. So I could get, if I wanted to do a little calculation, if I was curious what the hourly rate was, I could calculate that. So I can already see I'm probably gonna, I'm gonna have an unfavorable rate variance just by you know, visually seeing that. Um, I have how much variable overhead was incurred and how much fixed overhead was incurred. All right, so let's start with the direct material variance. Direct material variances are a little bit different because the actual quantity is what you bought for the price variance, but the actual quantity is what you used for the usage variance. So that's not true for labor because what you bought and what you use can't differ. You can't inventory labor, whereas you can inventory materials. All right, so let's get started here. So the actual price times the actual quantity, we already have that here. If, we, if they didn't give it to us in total, if they had just told us, for instance, that we spent $2.11 per ounce, we could have multiplied that times the 35000 and gotten this total. All right, and then given the 35000 ounces purchased, what should we have paid? All right, so we should have paid 35000 times that $2. So then the difference between these two is always the absolute value of the difference. So we don't express variances in plus or minus, but favorable or unfavorable. And then we inspect to see if this was favorable. So the actual cost was higher than the standard, so that's unfavorable. So we have an unfavorable material price variance. We want to do the usage variance. And the actual quantity for usage variance will not be the quantity purchased, but the quantity used. So here we want quantity used times standard price. Okay, so quantity used was the 34,000. The standard price is the two. And then over here, the standard price, of course, will be the $2, but the standard quantity is the quantity allowed for the volume that was produced. Not the volume budgeted, but the volume that was produced. So what was produced? 100,000. And for each box, I should have used a quarter of an ounce and I should have paid two dollars an ounce. So the absolute value of the difference is our variance and let's see the quantity used was bigger than the quantity allowed and how do I know that because the standard price is the same in both. So the only difference between these two numbers is the quantity and so this is higher so we have an unfavorable 
material quantity or material use variance. Some books call it a quantity variance, some books call it a usage variance. Both are okay terms. We have a similar situation in terms of the actual price times actual quantity because they gave us the total payroll. So they have already done that math of multiplying the hours worked, which we know here, times the rate. So what we were missing was the rate. So they can give you two of these three. They could have given you the rate and the total and you could have then solved for the hours or if they have given you the hours and the per hour, you could have solved for the total. So any of those things are possible. Okay, so now the standard price times the actual quantity. Okay, so there was 12,006. What should they have paid for each of those hours? They should have paid $8 an hour. And so then the difference, the absolute value of the difference here, the actual was higher than the standard. So that's an unfavorable. Now for labor, this middle term is identical. We don't have a difference between the actual quantity in the two variances. Here we could buy something different than what we use and the difference would go into to build up the raw materials inventory, but there's no such thing for labor. What you buy, you also use. And so we can use that same ter middle term as doesn't differ between the two variances. And then the standard price times the standard quantity. So the standard quantity is how much you should have used for the production you completed. And so we should have used 0.15 per box and the price should have been $8 each. So then the absolute value of the difference. And so this one is going to be favorable because what you used, given that the standard price is the same in both spots, what you used was less than what you were allowed to use. So that is a favorable labor efficiency. So now let's work on the overhead variances. Overhead variances are not as intuitive as material and labor variances because overhead is a pile of lots of different things and it's being smoothed out across a cost driver. And so the interpretations of the variances are very different. But first we're just going to do the computations like we're doing here and then we'll go back and talk about the story a little bit and try to understand the variances and the interpretations. So in this column for overhead, we put what we spent. And then for variable overhead, what we put in the middle is the actual hours, actual quantity, actual cost driver times the standard price. What were the actual labor hours? It was 12.6 and we should have spent in variable overhead $3 for each one of those. A variable overhead spending variance. And then over here, what we're going to put is how many hours we should have used times the variable overhead rate. We already know how many hours we should have used because we did that up in direct labor hours. So for each box that we made, we should have used 0.5 and we should have used three dollars worth of variable overhead for that. And so we actually have a favorable variable overhead efficiency variance. So for fixed overhead variances we'll put what was incurred here and then for the middle term, we're going to use the static budget. And so that's the total amount that we thought fixed overhead was going to be at the beginning of the year. So what was that? So it would have been the 90,000 boxes with that many labor hours per box and that per labor hour. So that's our static budget. And then what would have been applied to work in process is how many units did we create? times the 0.15 times the dollar fifty. So the difference between these two spots is the difference between plan volume and actual volume and that's why it's called the volume variance. In this case it's favorable. It's always favorable when your volume is higher than you budgeted and it's unfavorable when your volume is lower than what you expected. And then here we have just a very small favorable 
overhead, fixed overhead spending, spending variance. Okay, so now that we've kind of cranked out the math, let's talk about the story. This is where interpreting the calculations is very important. The, um, the issue in this particular problem was labor turnover. And so they decided to change some materials so that uh, there would be less labor and the conditions would be better for the workers. And so they changed out the materials to use pre-mixed and they're hoping that things will go better for them. So let's look at the variances after the first month and see whether or not this experiment looks interesting. So what happened here? We used, we paid more for materials. Would that surprise you because we bought pre-mixed rather than mix it ourselves? No, that wouldn't be a big surprise. We used a bunch more. Now, why would we have used more just because somebody else mixed it versus us mixing it? So this makes less sense. We understand why we would have had to pay more. How about down in the labor area? We paid a little bit more for labor here. So not sure why we would pay more for labor when we're not mixing chemicals. So that seems unrelated to our experiment. But look over here. Here we see something interesting. Here we see that we used a lot less labor. Well, that would make sense because they don't have to do the mixing. And the mixing is originally in the standard. Calculated in the standard would be to do the mixing. And calculated in the standard would be to buy unmixed chemicals and mix it yourself with your labor. So here we save 19, potentially, the data reflects that there's a possibility that's, that some or all of this favorable labor variances because they're not doing the mixing, but it only costs us another just about 4000 to buy it mixed. So if that reduces turnover and saves them time, this might be a good answer. Now let's look down at the variable overhead. What does it mean that variable overhead varies based on labor? So the more mixing and chemical activity that you do, the more cleanup and the more other ingredients, uh, um, holidays and vacation pay and 401k match and so forth, all sort of labor support is all in this variable overhead. So the more hours you have, the more you expect to have in those related costs. And so when you have fewer labor hours, you also have fewer of the things that come with labor hours. And so it magnifies the effect of the favorable labor efficiency variance because you expect there to be, for instance, if you're working shorter hours, the lights are turned off when you're not there. So if you're working an extra shift, you have all the utility cost associated with an extra shift. So if they left early or didn't have to work on Saturday, you saved those variable overhead items that were related to that activity that didn't have to occur because mixing happened on Saturdays and so we didn't have to come in on Saturday and mix or whatever the story is. Um, the variable overhead spending variance is really about the custodianship of whatever's in variable overhead. So if you spilled a bunch of chemicals, it's gonna show up here because you've got to go buy the cleaning solvent, whatever you spilled or whatever you lost or whatever got damaged that's, that's in the variable overhead chunk. Um, but over here, it's about the efficiency of the use of the thing that makes variable overhead bounce around. So in this case, direct labor hours. So notice that these are always going to be going in the same direction if it happens to be labor hours. If it's machine hours or something like that, it may not go in the same direction as labor. Now fixed overhead is an unusual beast because it's not variable. So the only thing we have is spending, and that's probably intuitive, and then volume. And that's just about whether you applied it into work and process based on a volume that was different than what you budgeted. And generally there is a volume variance because it's pretty hard to nail it during the budgeting process down to the actual units that you're gonna produce. Although it's possible that you produce exactly what you budget. 
but firms typically respond to demand and other changes. And so during the year, there would be a difference between what you produced and what you expected. So they also ask, what else might you wish to know before deciding, that's it, we're gonna buy pre-mixed chemicals and we're gonna save all this labor? So let's talk about a couple of things that might come to mind. Sometimes there's something called a halo effect. Um, there's some other names for it based on experiments, but in the first month that you do an experiment, everybody's watching. Everybody knows that everybody's watching because everybody's very curious. And anytime somebody feels watched, they're going to act a little bit differently. So workers that are being watched are probably on their best behavior and are probably not taking phone calls and not taking long breaks or whatever imperfections might happen on a day-to-day -day chronic level. So just one month of data may not be enough. You may want to have a 90-day or 120-day experiment, but clearly I would run this experiment another month but you might not be ready to change all of your standards, update everything, and say this is the new lock and load. Um, the other thing we're not sure about is whether our mixing it ourselves versus the vendor mixing it improved the quality of the product. So maybe the vendor is very good at mixing it, and so the suspension of the chemicals in the solution are extremely good, and there is no... Um, separating out or no sedimentation or no other problems in the chemistry. Um, or maybe there is. Maybe we do a better job of mixing it because we do it at a better temperature or we um, do it at a higher speed or whatever, better nozzles, whatever the situation is. So what we don't know here when we're just looking at the math is how did their mixing versus our mixing impact the quality of the finished goods. So then that's an important thing to study. So it's, sometimes it's not just about the math. The other thing we were curious about, of course, is the reason they were doing this experiment is to see whether or not labor would have fewer noxious fumes. So we would have to ask labor, did this in fact um, go better for you? And that's a qualitative thing you would have to ask your workforce. So for the first month, it looks like the materials cost more but we saved a lot of labor and because we saved labor we also saved labor related cost in terms of facility support and supplies um, that are in variable overhead so that was very helpful in terms of the economics of this so i have two more of these that are similar but the numbers are different and the story is slightly different and i'm going to post those and then we'll have a walkthrough of those as well so those definitely work them, now that we've had one walkthrough together, definitely work those first to see whether or not you're really clicking on this and then watch the walkthrough. And by the third one, you really should be able to work this independently before you look at the walkthrough. All right, best of luck.